to change the subject, creepy goings on in a goat town. These faces in a mural in the Trades Union Congress in London are those of the women who changed the course of British industrial history. The Match Girl Strike of 1888 was a milestone in the history of trade unionism, as for the first time, a group of unskilled workers went on strike for recognition of their rights and won. The Match Girls were led into battle by the most improbable champion, Annie Besant, a middle-class, middle-aged wife of an Anglican vicar who became one of the most notorious radicals of her day, fighting for social reform on many fronts. Today, to most people in Britain who have benefited directly from her work, her name is unknown. So 100 years after her greatest hour, we set out to record the times and triumphs of Mrs. Annie Besant. She's completely exceptional. She's important because she was a woman of passion and conviction and energy. Knowing what a great reputation she had, I was absolutely terrified at the thought of meeting her. And um, Mrs. Besant looked at me with an absolutely beaming smile. I've never seen such a radiant smile. And she really smiled with her eyes. And uh, at that moment, I thought I would worship her, you know, kneel down and worship her. She was a real orator. And of course, the only orator I've, I've heard. I mean, she was a much greater orator than Churchill. And it, as she, it was extraordinary sensation when she came into that hall. I mean, you couldn't have heard a pin drop. I mean, there this was this terrific feeling, this terrific presence. Her magnetic personality impressed George Bernard Shaw, the young Irish writer who was later to become her close friend. She was a born actress. She was successively a Puseyite Evangelican, an atheist Bible smasher, a Darwinian secularist, a Fabian socialist, a strike leader, and finally, a theosophist. She saw herself as a priestess above all. Whoever does not understand this, as I, a playwright, do, will never understand the career of Annie Besant. October the 1st, 1847. I'm credibly informed my baby eyes open to the light of a London afternoon at 5.39. It has always been somewhat of a grievance to me that I was born in London, within the sound of bow bells, when three quarters of my blood and all of my heart are Irish. My father died when I was five. My beloved mother was Irish. To her, the slightest breath of dishonor was to be avoided at any cost of pain, and she brought into me, her only daughter, that same proud and passionate horror at any taint of shame or merited disgrace. I've often thought that the training in this reticence and pride of honor was a strange preparation for my stormy, public, much attacked and slandered life. During my childhood, I had never had a harsh word spoken to me, never been ordered to do anything, had had my way smooth for my feet, and never a worry had touched me. It was the happiest time of my life. Religion played an important part in the life of the young Annie Wood, and although she had been raised in the austerity of the Church of England, her passionate nature was attracted to the Roman Catholic Church. 
I read tales of the early Christian martyrs and passionately regretted I was born so late when no suffering for religion was practicable. I would spend many an hour in daydreams in which I stood before Roman judges, before Dominican inquisitors, was flung to lions, tortured on the rack, burned at the stake. But always with a shock I was brought back to earth, where there were no heroic deeds to do, no lions to face, no judges to defy, but only some dull duty to be performed. And I used to fret that I was born so late, when all the grand things had been done, and when there was no chance of preaching and suffering for a new religion. The hidden life grew stronger, constantly fed by these streams of study. I fasted. I occasionally flagellated myself to see if I could bear physical pain, should I be fortunate enough ever to tread the pathway trodden by the saints. O God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, bless these thy servants, and sow the seed of eternal life in their hearts. At 20, Annie Wood reluctantly married an Anglican vicar, Frank Bazant. Look, O Lord, mercifully upon them from heaven and bless them, and as thou didst send thy blessing upon Abraham... In December 1867, I sailed out of the safe harbor of my happy and peaceful girlhood onto the wide sea of life, and the waves broke roughly as soon as the bar crossed. May abide in thy love unto their lives. together here in the sight of God to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, signifying We were an ill-matched pair, my husband and I, from the very outset. Christ and his church. And is commended of St. Paul to be honorable among all men, and therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand wantonly, unadvisedly, or lightly to satisfy men's carnal lusts he had very high ideas of a husband's authority and a wife's submission, holding strongly to the master in my own house theory. I, accustomed to freedom, indifferent to home details, impulsive, very hot-tempered, and proud as Lucifer. And forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live. I will. I feel a profound pity for the girl standing at this critical point of life, so utterly, hopelessly ignorant of all that marriage meant, so filled with impossible dreams, so unfitted for the role of wife. My daydreams held little place for love. I was full of fancies that twined themselves around the figure of Christ and the dawning feelings of womanhood lent to them a passionate fervor. I, Annie Wood, take thee, Frank Bazant, to my wedded husband. I, Annie Wood, take thee, Frank Bazant, to my wedded husband. I long to spend my time worshiping Jesus, absorbed in that passionate love of the Savior, which really is the human passion of love transferred to an idea. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and to obey till death us to part. To love, cherish, and to obey till death us to part. With this ring I thee wed, with my body I thee worship, and with all my worldly goods I thee endow. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the law, for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Looking back on it all, I deliberately say that no more fatal blunder can be made than to train a girl to womanhood 
in ignorance of all life's duties and physical burdens. That perfect innocence may be very beautiful, but many unhappy marriages date from that initial terrible shock to a young girl's sensitivity, modesty, and pride, her helpless bewilderment and fear. Victorian marriages had deep double standards. At one level, you have the man who has complete control over the property, over the woman, over the children, uh, can do what he likes, have mistresses, uh, go his own way. On the other, you have the notion of respectability, which is imbued in the woman, who might have ideas of her own, which she can't express, uh, might lose her faith, which she can't show. And so there is this sort of double morality that you find very much in Victorian households. So many marriages went wrong. Uh, because of the ignorance and innocence. Uh, so I could should think she suffered very much over that, um, because she knew nothing, I gather, at all. She hadn't been told. And I remember my, um, my grandmother must have been born about the same year as Mrs. Besant. And I remember she telling me that all she'd been told by her mother was to keep a pot of cold cream by the bed and never refused to do anything her husband asked her. That was her preparation for marriage. Frank Bizant became the vicar of Sibsey, a small village in Lincolnshire. In 1867, the young couple moved into this old vicarage. She bore her husband two children, but her marriage was profoundly unhappy. She'd become interested in politics and new philosophical ideas. The Reverend Frank Bizant had no sympathy with his wife's intellectual hunger and she became the victim of his violent outbursts. Harshness roused first incredulous wonder, and after a time, a proud, defiant resistance, cold and hard as iron. The easygoing, sunshiny, enthusiastic girl changed, and changed pretty rapidly into a grave, proud, reticent woman, burying deep in her own heart all her hopes, her fears, and her disillusions. One day I went to his church alone. A queer whim took me that I would like to know how it felt to preach, and vague fancies stirred in me that I could speak if I had a chance. If you want inspiration to feeling, to sentiment, perhaps you had better keep your Bible and your creeds. If you want inspiration to work, go and walk through the East End of London or the back streets of Manchester. You are inspired to tenderness when you gaze at the wounds of Jesus, dead in Judea long ago, and you find no inspiration in the wounds of men and women dying in the England of today, you have tears to shed for him, but none for the sufferers at your doors. 
His passion arouses your sympathies. But you find no pathos in the passion of the poor? I shall never forget the feeling of power and delight, but especially of power that came upon me as I sent my voice ringing down the aisles. And as though in a dream, the solitude was peopled, and I saw the listening faces and the eager eyes. I knew of a verity that the gift of speech was mine. When Annie was 25, she left her husband and renounced her Christian faith. She went to London with her daughter Mabel, changed the pronunciation of her name from Bezant to Besant, and started a new life. She began a career as a journalist and made new friends with free thinkers and atheists, including the most notorious of them all, Charles Bradlaugh. Together they fought for their radical beliefs, culminating in the publication of the infamous Knowlton pamphlet written by an American doctor. It was the first document to give practical advice on contraception to ordinary women. The year 1877 dawned, and a struggle began, which though ending in victory, brought with it pain and anguish that I scarcely care to recall. Annie was already well known as a public speaker and writer who challenged the accepted wisdom and scandalized the establishment. Her atheism was considered an outrage and her friendship with Bradlaugh became the subject of many attacks in the press. bestial man and woman who go about earning a livelihood by corrupting the young of England. There is a woman going up and down the country lecturing and maybe in London City at this moment. She proudly cries out that there is no God and she takes out her watch and says, now if there be a God I give him five minutes to strike me dead. And she coolly stands watching the hands of her watch dial. And because she is not struck dead, by the time she stipulates, she cries out, there is no God. And working men run after this woman, pay for listening to her. Ginger beer blasphemy and half drunken ravings. If truth be told, I dreaded a new scandal. Could we, the teachers of a lofty morality, venture to face a prosecution for publishing what would be technically described as an obscene book and risk the ruin of our future? To publish a book about birth control would mean the loss of the pure reputation I prized, scandal the most terrible a woman could face, maybe imprisonment. But I had seen the misery of the poor, of my sister women with children crying for bread. Should I set my own safety, my own good name against the helping of these? What was worth all my talk about self-sacrifice and self-surrender if brought to the test I failed? So with heart aching, but steady, I came to my resolution. We would publish the pamphlet about birth control. The Solicitor General will now read the indictment. Thank you, my lord. The charge is that the defendants, Mrs. Annie Besant and Charles Bradlaugh, unlawfully and wickedly devising, contriving and intending as much as in them lay, to vitiate and corrupt the morals as well of youth as of divers other lead subjects of Our Lady the Queen, and to incite and encourage the said lead subjects to indecent obscene, unnatural, and immoral practices, and bring them to a state of wickedness, lewdness, and debauchery, unlawfully, wickedly, knowingly, willfully, and designedly did print, publish, sell, and utter a certain indecent, lewd, filthy, and obscene libel 
to wit a certain indecent, lewd, filthy body and obscene book called Fruits of Philosophy, thereby contaminating, vitiating, and corrupting the morals. What I shall ask the jury will be very much like this. If they take the statements contained in the work to be a treatise on obstetric medicine, do they think there is anything in it which the writer was not justified in writing? And looking to the whole character of the work, do they think it is introduced into the work merely for the purposes of medical knowledge, useful for people to know? Or do they think it is an obscene work? Meaning by obscene tending to influence the passions, or recommending a course of conduct inconsistent with public morals. My lord and gentlemen of the jury, the nature of the book appears to me to be this. The writer contends that it is not an improper thing to gratify any animal passion which human nature may be susceptible of. That it is lawful and proper and expedient to disseminate among the people a minute description of physical means whereby the population may be checked so that the commerce of the sexes may be permitted to continue and that by various means which he minutely describes the result of conception and the consequent birth of children may be averted but my lord silence my lord it is not whether a work of this kind can be submitted to a college of philosophy, but whether it can be sold at the price of sixpence about the streets of London and elsewhere. And it is with a view to stopping that publication that the law has interfered. But we have here in the work before us a chapter on restriction of population. Not written in any learned language, but in plain English and sold in the public streets for sixpence. Gentlemen, you must first establish that the work is an obscene work. The defendants may tell me about American doctors, but it is not to be permitted that doctors in England shall have a right to circulate such filth and then be allowed to substantiate it by instances from other medical works? Is it to be said that because these things may be discussed and considered in the closet of the physician, that they may be broadcast all over the streets? If you accept that, you entirely subvert the principle which is properly deducible, and there is no such thing as indecency and obscenity at all. A man who had the view that the human figure was the most beautiful in the world might claim the right to walk naked through the streets oh. and might triumphantly say, I am exhibiting nothing but the natural parts. <laughs> and it is only a prurient mind that will find anything improper in it. My lord! Silence! And you might push it to the extreme of saying that inasmuch as sexual intercourse is a natural provision, there is nothing improper in publicly performing it. Oh, my lord! Sit! Down. Gentlemen, I venture to submit that the whole scope and tendency of giving such a minute description of all that has relation to the sexual appetite and the apparatus concerned therein constitutes an obscene book. I submit to you that it is an obscene book. The mode of the publication is such as does not justify the book. It is calculated to deprave and destroy the minds of those young persons, especially into whose hands the book may come. And therefore, it is properly the subject of an indictment. But doctors... Don't talk to me about doctors! I care not if every physician in England had written a book of this character. There can be no justification for that book which is calculated to deprave the minds of those into whose hands it may call. Therefore, ask your judgment that this book is an obscene publication.
I think we can assume that the learned Solicitor General objects to the whole book from beginning to end. And now the defendants. I understand that you wish to make your defense first. Thank you, my lord. It was the first time ever that a woman defended herself in an English court. Annie Besant spoke about that great Victorian taboo, sex. My lord and gentlemen of the jury, it will not seem strange to any of you here today if in defending myself I find myself slightly overweighted by the amount of legal ability which the prosecution has thought it well to bring against me. I might feel less hopeful of success did I pretend to rival Solicitor General in force of tongue, in skill of dialectic, or in legal knowledge. But gentlemen, I do not rely on these. I rely on a far mightier power. I trust to the goodness of my cause. It is not as defendant that I plead to you today. Not merely in defending myself do I stand before you, but I speak as counsel for hundreds of the poor, and it is they for whom I defend this case. My clients are scattered up and down the length and breadth of this land. I find my clients amongst the fathers who see their wages ever reducing and prices ever rising. I find my clients amongst the mothers, worn out with over-frequent childbearing. I find my clients amongst the little children. Gentlemen, do you know the plight of so many of these children? Half-starved, because there is enough food for two, but not enough for twelve. Half-clothed, because their mothers, no matter what their skill and care, cannot afford to clothe them with the money brought home by the breadwinner of the family. Gentlemen, I risk my name. I risk my liberty. I put it to you that there is nothing wrong in a natural desire rightly and properly gratified. There is no harm in feeling thirsty just because people get drunk. There is no harm in feeling hungry just because people overeat themselves. And there is no harm in the gratifying of the sexual instinct if it can be done so without an injury to anyone else, without harms to the morals of society, and with due regard to the health of those whom nature has given us the power of summoning into the world. I put it to you gravely that it is only a false and spurious kind of modesty which sees harm in the gratification of one of the highest instincts of human nature, an instinct which goes through all the world, not only in the animal, but also in the vegetable kingdom. If you are to blame Dr. Knowlton for recognizing this great natural fact, then it is your duty to blame the constitution of the world or the arrangements of nature as we know them, for there you will find that the reproductive instinct is attended with pleasure in its due gratification. I hold in the words of our preface, gentlemen, that it is more moral to prevent the birth of children than it is after they are born to murder them as you do today by want of food, clothing, air and sustenance. I say that man's reason is given to him by nature so that he may, by his reason and his intellect, prevent that suffering that results from the laws of nature without man. I shall call upon you, gentlemen, to return a verdict of not guilty and to send me home free, believing from my heart and from my conscience that I have only been guilty in doing that which I ought to do in grappling with the terrible poverty and misery around us on every hand. Unless you are prepared, gentlemen, to brand me with malicious meaning, I ask you as an Englishwoman for that justice which is not impossible to expect at the hands of English men. I ask you to return a verdict of not guilty 
and to send me home unstained. After long deliberations, the jury found the defendants guilty, but they received only light suspended sentences. On appeal, the indictment was deemed technically incorrect and they were cleared of all charges. It was an important victory. The trial was very important at different levels. I suppose the first level, which is the sensational level, is that here she was, a woman uh, charged within the sense of sanity, uh, defending herself. She, she spoke for two days, uh, fluently and with great passion, but with also great logic. I mean, that was extraordinary and exceptional. So that level, amazing. The second level, of course, it brought out into the open the whole question of contraception, of poverty, of the division of England into two camps. And I, I think that that was also important. I mean, I think that those who were interested in reform perhaps were heartened by that kind of trial, which was also, if you like, a trial of society. It was Bernard Shaw, tremendously impressed with Annie's inspired performance during the trial, who introduced her to the new ideology of socialism. It held an immediate attraction for Annie, but not for Bradlaugh and her other radical friends. They felt betrayed, and so she came under attack again. Will it always be, I wonder, in man's climbing upwards, that every step must be set on his own heart and the hearts of those he loves? I have heard Mrs. Besant described as being, like most women, at the mercy of her last male acquaintance for her views on economics. The moment a man uses a woman's sex to discredit her arguments, the thoughtful reader knows that he is unable to answer these arguments himself. But really, these silly sneers at women's ability have lost their force and are best met with a laugh at the stupendous male self-conceit of the writer. I may add that such shafts are especially pointless against myself. A woman who has thought her way out of Christianity and Whiggism into free thought and radicalism absolutely alone, who gave up every old friend, male and female, who again in embracing active socialism has run counter to the views of her nearest male friends, such a woman may very likely go wrong, but I think she may venture without conceit to at least claim independence of judgment. A bitter and unforeseen consequence of the trial was that Annie's husband was able to gain custody of their daughter Mabel on the grounds that his wife was an unsuitable guardian. The said Annie Besant is by addresses, lectures and writings endeavouring to propagate the principles of atheism and has published a book entitled The Gospel of Atheism. She has also associated herself with an infidel lecturer and author named Charles Bradlaugh in giving lectures and publishing books and pamphlets whereby the truth of the Christian religion is impeached and disbelief in all religion inculcated. I therefore submit that the said Annie Besant is an unfit parent and that her husband ought to be the only custodian of his daughter Mabel.
No access to her was given me, and I gave notice that if access were denied me, I would sue for restitution of conjugal rights, merely that I might see my child. But the strain had been too great, and I nearly went mad. The loneliness and silence of the house waited on me like an evil dream. She was extraordinarily affected by, by the loss of Mabel. She, she felt very strongly that somehow she had failed and she talked at great length of death and loneliness. So yes, I mean, does, I don't think it makes any difference that she's made speeches all over the place. She was deeply devoted to, after all, her last child. I immersed myself in public work. The cry of starving children was ever in my ears. The sobs of women poisoned in lead works, exhausted in nail works. I knew I had to become a socialist. Nowhere on the bleak industrial landscape was the safety and well-being of the workers a notable feature. The Bryant and May matchmaking factory in East London became the centre of industrial unrest. In June of 1888, Annie Besant went to see for herself the conditions in which the girls worked. Of the 1,400 workers, the vast majority were young girls and children, some as young as six years old. In the matchmaking industry as a whole, Half the workforce were children, described at the time as the poorest of the poor and the lowest of the low. They worked from 6.30 in the morning until 6 at night. As they worked, they breathed in phosphorus fumes, which caused abscesses, resulting in the loss of teeth and eventually the loss of the jawbone itself, a condition from which one in eight of the workforce suffered. A typical case is that of a girl of 16, a piece worker. She earns four shillings a week. Out of the earnings, two shillings is paid for the rent of one room. The child lives only on bread and butter and tea, alike for breakfast and dinner. The splendid salary of four shillings is subject to deductions in the shape of fines. If the feet are dirty or the ground under the bench is left untidy, a fine of three shillings is inflicted. The wage covers the duty of submitting to an occasional blow from a foreman. Annie published her revelations in a socialist newspaper under the heading White Slavery in London and sent a copy to Mr. Frederick Bryant, the owner of the factory. She didn't have to wait long for a reply. Letter to hand this morning, nothing but a tissue of lies article will receive legal attention. Amid the deluge of press attacks and hate mail, Annie received a different kind of letter, a letter from the match girls themselves. My dear lady, thank you very much for the kind interest you have taken in this poor girls and hope you will succeed in your undertakings. Dear lady, you need not trouble yourself about the letter that Mr. Bryant sent you because you have spoken the truth and we are very pleased to read it. Dear lady, they are trying to get us poor girls to say that it was all lies that has been printed and trying to make them sign papers to say it's lies. Dear lady, no one knows what we have to put up with and we will not sign them. We all thank you very much for the kindness you have shown to us. You had spoke up for us, and we aren't going back on you. My dear lady, 
We hope you will not get into any trouble on our behalf, as what you have spoken is quite true. They left work there and then. A hundred of them marched to Fleet Street yesterday afternoon to see Mrs. Besant. I shall deal with those in that factory in a way that would make an example of them to the others. Probably this would be by refusing to take any of them on again. I have no doubt that they have been influenced by the twaddle of Mrs. Besant and other socialists. No effort has been spared by those pests of the modern industrial world, the Social Democrats, to bring the quarrel to a head. Annie Besant publishes an open letter to the shareholders of the Bryant and May Company in which she accuses them of blood guiltiness. Ladies and gentlemen, Today, I have some words to say to you. So that if you are ignorant of the crimes done in your name, you may stand up as honest men and women and cleanse yourselves from the stain which dishonors, from the sin which pollutes. Do you know that the women and girls whose hard labor made you 22 and a half percent dividend eat their food in the same rooms in which they work so that the fumes of the phosphorus mix with their poor meal. And they eat disease as seasoning to their bread. Yes, disease, I say. For the fossy jaw, which they talk about, means caries of the jaw. And this works on them, the poisonous phosphorus as they chew their food and rots away the bone. Oh, your foremen have sharp eyes, for when they see one of the girl's faces swell up, they know the sign. She is discharged immediately and given no pay at all during her absence. Do you know? that the girls are used to carry boxes on their heads until their hair is rubbed off. Their young heads are bald at 15 years of age. Country clergymen with shares in Bryant and Mays draw down on your knee your 15-year-old daughter, pass your hand tenderly across the thick cluster of curls, rejoicing in the thick shining tresses, and then like a ghastly vision, let there rise up before you the pale worn face of another vision. Let there rise up before you the pale worn face of another man's 15-year-old daughter with pale, wistful, pathetic eyes. See her as she removes her battered hat to show her head robbed of her hair by the constant rubbing of the boxes, robbed of her hair to make your dividends the larger for the price of the pads that might for her have saved the grace of a womanhood already slaved out of beauty. On the 15th of July, 1888, the findings of an independent inquiry were published, confirming what Annie had written in the first place. On the 16th of July, 1888, with their public image increasingly tarnished, the directors of Bryant and May agreed to a conference between themselves and the workers. Two days later, the girls went back to work, having won an historic victory. It was finally agreed that all fines should be abolished, all deductions for paint, brushes, stamps should be put an end to, the three shillings should be restored to packers, all grievances should be laid directly before the firm before any hostile action was taken, and all the girls were to be taken back. The firm hoped the girls would form a union. Everybody hailed the end of the strike as a great victory but I was not happy. The Batch Girl Strike was the first victory of general unionism. Annie Besant is the founder, if you like, of the Transport and General Workers Union, of the General Municipal and Boilermakers Union. She began it all because she managed to persuade completely unskilled workers, and that's the point, she's the first unskilled union, 
to be solid, to go out solidly on strike, and she defeated the employers. On Wednesday evening, we perambulated the lanes and alleys lying around Bethnal Green Junction and sought out starving people in their homes. What sights we saw. Rooms stripped of all furniture save the heavy frame of a wooden bed. Children lying on shavings, rags, anything. Famine looking out of baby faces, out of women's eyes, out of the tremulous hands of men. Hearts grew sick and eyes dim as we trudged in deepening darkness from house to house, climbing narrow stairs where the walls rubbed each shoulder, groping along passages left dusky because of the cost of light. And at the same moment in the West, we knew myriads of lamps were sparkling over the heads of gaily dressed women and highly bred men. Their rays flashed back from countless diamonds, glittering on golden plate and silver epan, breaking on the foam of costly wines, gleaming through the scented tangle of exotic growths and fragrant dainty blooms. Ever more and more had been growing on me, the feeling that something more than I had was needed for the cure of social ills. The socialist position sufficed on the economic side. But where to gain the inspiration, the motive, which would lead to the realization of the brotherhood of man? Where was the material for the nobler social order where the hewn stones for the building of the temple of man. A great despair would oppress me as I sought for such a movement and found it not. It was at that moment in her life that Annie discovered theosophy, a new movement loosely based on Eastern religions with their belief in the purity of spiritual life, reincarnation, and the occult. In 1889, the year after the Match Girl strike, she was asked to review The Secret Doctrine, a thesis by Madame Blavatsky, leader of the movement. As I turned over page after page, the interest became absorbing. I was dazzled by the light in which disjointed facts were seen as parts of a mighty whole, and all my puzzles, riddles, problems seemed to disappear. I knew that the very truth was found. Two years later, Madame Blavatsky died and Annie Besant became the president of the Theosophical Society, an office that she held for the rest of her life. She continued her relentless battle for social reform on new fronts, fighting for home rule for India and establishing the first Hindu university. Both Gandhi and Nehru acknowledged their debt to her. In 1933, she died in India. <laughs> 